This video was brought to you by Marcus Beal, Elbil Mac, Abadur Planner, Stoltenberg, Camp Power, and Beal Componente. Yo, what's up? We are now in uh, Arendal at uh, a future fact a battery factory. And with me today, I have Raoul from uh, Moro. Uh, is it just called Moro or? Uh, it's called Moro Batteries. Moro Batteries. Uh, so today we will have this interview. I have several videos uh, coming up. We will have a, a dedicated factory tour. But today we'll just talk about the whole factory and uh, you are more in the R&D, right? Well, That's right. So, so let me see. Um, I have tons of questions about this factory. So it's like, it's a battery factory in Norway. But, huh? but in general, in people's mind, batteries are produced in China, isn't it? So why Norway? I think, uh, yes, traditionally the batteries were produced in Asia in China, in Korea, in Japan. But now with all this big movement to make electrical cars in, uh, in Europe, it uh, it's, has to happen that we start making components for electrical cars also in Europe. And the battery cells are probably the biggest uh, and most important uh, components towards the electrical car. So there is a lot of work happening to make uh, cells, battery cells in Europe. Uh, and uh, Scandinavia and in particular Norway is a great uh, location to actually do it. Uh, the, I mean, one of the reasons for all this electrification is to make actually clean uh, transition towards clean uh, technologies. And you don't want cells to be built with the kind of unclean power. In Norway, almost all power is hydroelectrical. That's very clean. And so the f carbon dioxide footprint of a cell which is produced in Norway is one of the lowest in the world, if not the lowest in the world. So, sorry, can I interrupt? Uh, compared to, for example, China, and uh, Korea, Japan, you mentioned. How is the energy mix over there? I mean, China is based still, I mean, China has d deployed a lot of renewables, but still they have most of the power is, uh, is coal based. In Japan, I mean, it's there is very, very little renewable power. They have nuclear power. They had this Fukushima thing. I mean, this is one of the challenges they have. And maybe that's also a reluctance of Japan to transition towards actually electrical cars. And Korea also doesn't have ample hydroelectrical power. So, I mean, Norway, I mean, this is, is blessed with the clean energy. And I think that has that is a great kind of foundation on which we can uh, build uh, large scale manufacturing of battery cells. Yeah, plus that uh, more and more production of electric cars would be in Europe uh, eventually, right? Sure. So that means shorter travel distance instead of shipping raw materials to Asia and then using not so clean uh, electricity and then ship it over to Europe for assembly. Now we're doing it locally. Yeah, yeah. And that is the future because uh, you cannot, I mean, we are talking about tens of thousands of cell, t tons of cells which have to be moved and they are being moved currently. Eventually all the large cell, uh, large car factories, truck factories, they would have cell manufacturing within a few hours from there. And I mean, Arandal, where we sit right now, is a big port, you know, we are connected to all the major harbors of Europe, to Hamburg, to Amsterdam, to Gothenburg, and so it's very quick, we can very quickly send the products which we make here to all the major production sites in Europe. Hmm. Okay, great. Uh, but this should also mean that, you know, the, the skeptics, uh, they talk about that uh, um, electric cars has a quite big uh, CO2 footprint, so if we can produce the cells in Norway, it should be a lot less, right? A lot less, lot tra less. Transportation, but also for production. So, I mean, there is, you have to drive an electrical car for some amount of period before it becomes like CO2 parity with a, with a small ICE vehicle. But if that's the cells for that uh, car are made in a country like Norway, and if it's running on the power mix like Norway, you almost immediately are CO2 kind of neutral compared to an ICE vehicle. So, I think, that is a way forward. If you want to transition towards electrical supply chain, you have to see where the energy comes from. And uh, yeah, and I think that's, like I said, is, a, is one of the great advantages we have here in Norway uh, to do that. And the, there's also other things like the government of Norway, the society of Norway is very keen on electrification. I mean, as you know, I mean, you drive this uh, electrical car and are strongly kind of promoting it. Uh, people here understand that batteries get the job done, which is not, not the case everywhere. <laughs> yeah. And I think uh, there is this enthusiasm to basically have this industry here. 
there are so many electrical cars here i mean why i think that this only logical that components for those cars are also starting to be made here in norway okay so i think uh, it makes complete sense for me that this is actually happening here it's not has it's not has has it has not happened historically but that is no reason that it should not happen in the future okay well yeah uh, so it's interesting um i want to talk more about the uh, cells by the way so we have one of the cells here yes and uh, which form factor is this so the cells we make in moro if you see guys here it's it's a prismatic cell so there are three main form factors uh, it's pouch uh, cylindrical and prismatic most of the car manufacturers going forward are either going to use uh, prismatic cells or cylindrical cells and uh, we have decided to go for prismatic it's actually quite uh, sophisticated to design and manufacture a prismatic cell but they are in our opinion the most uh, the safest format uh, of cells in a car they can also be packed at a very good density inside uh, inside the inside the module because you have no kind of empty spaces uh, as you would have in a cylindrical format and uh, there's less edge effects so yeah this is the format we are going to make and I, we believe that uh, we would have a lot of interest from big car companies which we also know have prismatic cells on their road maps okay uh, can i take a look then sure yeah. This is just a, we well, just a dummy. It's like you hear this uh, thing. It's not like that in the production. Uh, but uh, when it comes to chemistry and what what chemistry are going for? Yeah, good question. So I mean, like you say, this is just an aluminium can. It's it's like a 0.8 liters in volume, and um, and chemistry is a very big thing because chemistry is a sauce. You know, which determines how long. Uh, if you had a car built of different cells, how long the car would ride? How fast would it charge? Etc. Etc. One of the things in Moro when we started the company was that how can we make the most sustainable batteries and also how can we make very low cost batteries. And interestingly, a lot of the cost of batteries is not linked to the production cost, it's linked to the material cost. So there's two questions uh, which are really important where one, where the materials would come from, B, how can you bring the cost down. So our solution to that was uh, technology basically. So we are uh, working now on uh, four products actually which are classified in two different generations the generation one is more standard products the lithium iron phosphate cells and the nmc cells which would come in the next one or two years but what we are really excited about and we are really pioneering is completely new chemistry it's a manganese based chemistry uh, which is actually manganese is a uh, much more widely available material is far more cheaper and uh, has actually very good properties so basically we are developing a cell now which would have the performance of a high nickel cell at a cost of lithium iron phosphate cell wow which is uh, going to be very very revolutionary as you can imagine uh, so uh, especially for the people who know these chemistries uh, lithium iron phosphate used to be cheaper and safer and nmc is basically still high performance and more expensive but the chemistry we are developing, this LNMO based chemistry uh, is really going to make that bridge. It's also going to, it has no cobalt inside it, which is a, one of the problematic materials. It's coming mostly from Congo. It has far less nickel inside it. We use lithium much more efficiently in the battery cell. And a lot of people ask me, so why would you be able to do that? Uh, I mean, if the Chinese could not do that and Koreans could not do that. And I think that's important to understand there's two factors behind it. A, we are not saying that we would have this battery next year in market. Uh, this will come 25, 26 onwards. Uh, we have close to 100 people now, uh, dedicated PhD scientists and researchers we have hired who are really working day and night diligently to actually solve this problem. So we are heavily investing in R&D to get this thing going and working with actually world-class partners currently comp some of the largest companies in europe who are also very interested in this uh, products we are developing so it's not going to be easy but we know that it's not going to be easy we have geared up for it and uh, we are very confident that we would be basically pioneering this whole new set of chemistry this high manganese lnmo chemistry and then uh this, this factory uh uh, are, what, what part are you doing? Are you doing the refining of materials or is it assembly of the cells or what's going on? In the yeah, battery? sure. That's also a very interesting thing. So the battery cells, of course, uh, we are making the cells, the cell, uh, the coating and the assembly, which is the cell fabrication process. But 
but there's a lot of things that go in the cell graphite goes in the cell all the active materials go in the cell and they then actually also come from refining itself as of now we are only focusing on cell manufacturing okay so this factory which you would go soon is just a cell manufacturing facility but we have ambitions in medium term to also go into active material manufacturing which is basically for this new material technology we were saying we want to on this same site you see around us uh, build a active material factory as well especially for the high manganese lnmo so that would be the next step because once you make the battery cells clean the question would be are the materials made with clean energy so actually ideally you want to have as much as value chain the whole value chain to the mine on kind of clean energy and then you have this road to zero your, your battery cell is basically built with zero co2 and i think that should be the ambition of uh, all major manufacturers okay so initially when we talk about uh, the yeah what well, manufacturing uh, how how much co2 we are uh, you know hmm. pushing out so uh, since you're not doing the material uh, refinement uh, which part of that is the heaviest in energy yeah so the, the material part is more heavy than the cell part so while we will take a significant part out by making the cells here if you really want to make a huge dent you have to of course also start making materials here the good news is there is norwegian companies like uh, via node which is uh, basically supported by hydro and elkem they are uh, setting up a graphite factory in postgrun which is a component that also goes in the battery cells and they would also have clean graphite that i'm very happy to see that this kind of supply chain is also being developed in uh, in scandinavia which is clean supply chain but we we don't have the like lfp powder we basically actually cannot buy it anywhere in europe so the first cell the lfp the active material has to be imported from asia there are some initiatives coming up but it's in my opinion still a bit slow so i i hope that there are more entrepreneurs there are more governmental support there is more pull from the society that we should try to basically reshore the whole industry back to europe so we have the technological edge and we are able to kind of control the control the value chain much much better so uh, today do you have uh, agreements with suppliers of materials and of course yeah so this cell i mean uh, we will go soon in the factory we are ready to produce this cell uh, in the second quarter second half of this year basically so uh, and this is a large factory so we'll produce hundreds of megawatt hours actually already this year uh, from the factory and that requires us to already have all the agreements in place so for our first product which is the lithium iron phosphate based uh, cell we have signed all the all the agreements actually this may look this this is about 30 or 40 small pieces of materials that go into this from tapes to metallic minor metallic parts foils electrolytes additives uh, you know it's a lot of uh, lot of agreements that we have signed yeah but most of them in at least for the first cells are with asian manufacturers like i said our road map is that we want to transition more to european manufacturers and they are also kind of maturing as we are maturing and our belief is that uh, for several reasons for geopolitical reasons for sustainability reasons for innovation reasons we like to see a more european supply chain for batteries yeah because uh the problem maybe in europe is that the labor cost here might be higher uh, so how how is the price here can you guys compete with china or yeah. korea yeah so this is the question we get a lot a lot so for the first generation batteries we it would be a challenge to compete with them it we would we will do our best uh we are buying the materials at uh, at a very good cost level we have to run the factories at a very high quality level which means the scrapage should be as less as possible so we are very high utilization of the machines the yield is very high so basically we we are able to kind of bring the cost uh, of pro product you know the unit economics as efficient as possible but it will still be challenging to compete uh, with the chinese and uh, we have to really make some twist in the product that uh, the customers feel that okay we have something better to offer i mean we also have to recognize uh, that especially what happened in the covid times was that lot of uh, customers didn't did not get batteries from china there was like uh, almost a havoc in the market so now there is a there is a actual demand in the market from small and big oems they really don't want to have just one shop to go and buy the cells from they they want to have a kind of a local company which can supply that and we want to be that reliable local company 
so that is the short term thing but the long term when we will transition to the, our next generation technology then we are the, the whole cost of the materials is so much cheaper than the cost of the materials which is in the first generation battery then we believe we'll be very competitive with anybody in the world including the chinese so that is where we are basically putting a lot of our bets like i said you know tens of millions of dollars and hundreds of people are currently working to develop that technology and uh, i'm confident that we will basically have that technology in the market in a few years and that'll be quite revolutionary actually hmm okay cool uh yeah so <laughs> it, it, very interesting uh i feel like it's it's like uh, you have to go uh, upstream now <laughs> with this work but but do you have any any car manufacturers in Europe that you have signed some agreement with uh, because you, you okay you have the the, res the resources part but what about selling sales yeah so actually this uh, we are uh, since almost a year working with i cannot name the car company because they want it to be a bit uh, hush hush hopefully it would change in a few months from now but uh, one of the most reputable car brands in in Europe is actually working with us very closely on our new technology which we which i just mentioned they're very keen on that they are investing in that technology in the in the project we are doing they've also kind of dedicated a huge part of their research team to also work on that technology so that is what i would say the closest relationship we, we have with the car company uh, in europe we are also working with a lot of uh, smaller energy storage companies so one of the other markets we're looking at is not only the car market is also the the energy storage market the grid scale energy storage and residential storage which is a very fast growing market and those are much smaller companies they're not as big as the large car companies so we have uh, conversations with a lot of them some of those um, kind of agreements are public already which we have a kind of a definitive uh, supply agreements with them some are in the making uh so but it has to be it has to be matured as when the factory comes online when we are able to show that we can make the production at a very high quality at very low uh, level of uh, scrappage uh we expect a lot of companies would come to us because there is still this hesitation can a european player basically compete with large uh, asians but uh, i mean i know we would do that so it's just a matter of time when we will have these companies talking to us hmm. more and more companies so you mentioned some of the materials like cobalt uh, previously but you know uh, this the anti ev the skeptics they always uh, blame ev drivers that okay you guys are trying to be clean but remember that you are using rare earth material or whatever they say and i like they they claim that eventually when the whole world is running on or if or when the whole world is running on electric cars then there will simply not be enough materials to make these cells is that true how are we going to solve it or no i think this is as far as from truth as possible i think and it's completely kind of driven by propaganda let me explain you how first of all uh, i mean the materials that go in the battery cells even now they are not rare actually they are quite widely available so we have lithium uh, which is in rocks uh, in australia it is in brine lakes in uh, latin america in huge amounts and they are finding more and more kind of lithium discoveries there was a big uh, discovery in india lately there is a huge amount of deposits in north america etc so there is no anticipated shortage shortage of lithium and like i said cobalt is a bit more localized and there is a huge amount of work including the work we are doing on developing cobalt free batteries so we would not be having cobalt more in the in the batteries going forward so so you mean that the, the cobalt we have today it's just like a middle step ultimately we don't need cobalt in the batteries yeah it's already actually even if you look at the tesla cars with this nca batteries they have it's hardly any cobalt inside it it's 90% nickel i mean it's like it's like the parmesan or your spaghetti it's like so little you know it's uh, it's not really the main component you have and even that little amount is going to be going out like our lnmo batteries the lfp batteries have absolutely zero zero cobalt so and then uh, i mean the rest phosphorus i mean there was a huge discovery of uh, phosphates actually in norway itself norway could become one of the leading providers of phosphates for uh, for, for basically lfp based batteries and more and more discoveries are happening every day and then there is another big thing which people have to understand that when you extract oil and you burn oil you, the oil is gone is finished 
But with batteries, you know, you'll have recycling. Almost everything that would be going in a battery cell would be recycled. And so you really have those materials, you can use them for eternity. And I think, uh, and battery cells are also getting better and better. You know, car companies thought that the, they would last two years, three years, four years. Now you have EVs that are 10 years old. They still have 10 years lifetime in a second life application after that. So even after 20 years of usage, you can take that material, put that through a shredder, get black mask, refine that and again recycle it. This would never happen with oil, right? It's done. Once you have burned it, you have just CO2. And uh, so I, there is going to be some intensity of uh, kind of mining and refining activities to kind of get to speed. But eventually uh, electrified uh, supply chain is far, far, far better than what we have with this oil based supply chain. Well, uh, when you mentioned the, the recycling, by the way, very interesting topic, by the way. You know, maybe many people don't think that these phones, once they are too old, well, there's also a battery in there. Yeah, sure. Uh, they are not landfill. <laughs> They, they actually end up in some recycling Absolutely. Activity. Absolutely. The, the raw materials are being reused for yes. new phones. And that's the same thing you have to think about uh, electric cars. The batteries are not just dumped in the river. Because those, those cells, if this would be an old cell after 10, 20 years, whatever, right? It has high value. Absolutely. Now, there are many governments, I was talking to people in India, in Norway, they say once lithium comes to the country, it would never leave the country. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they would not let it leave. They will keep on recycling it eternity because if these countries don't have it, they will not let it go. So, a lot of refining capacity is built. There's, act there's also a refining operation. Uh, I don't know, it's called uh, Hydrovolt. It's between uh, Hydro and Northvolt uh, somewhere in Norway. There's other kind of operations being built. Uh, the thing with these refining operations right now is that all they still don't have enough capacity of batteries to recycle. But as more and more people buy EVs, uh, the whole then they have kind of uh, ability to build economy of scale plants, which you need to build to actually run these things and get some profit out of them. And it's all happening, you know, in the US, Redwood is doing that. They'll recycle all Tesla batteries. Uh, in, in Germany, there are initiatives. In Scandinavia, there's initiatives. So recycling together with this kind of diversification of the material base together uh, you know we are talking about batteries made of sodium batteries made of manganese uh, made of zinc so it's not just one short solution we are talking about so you have all these different materials going in which are not rare and then you are, have the ability to recycle them i think this is far better than what we have currently with the with the oil based uh, setup and also when you recycle uh, when we talk about the CO2 footprint again, that's always the argument against EV. <laughs> when you recycle, how is the CO2 footprint versus when you have to uh, refine from or, or mine it? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think, uh, of course, recycle has maybe a magnitude 10 times higher content of the minerals you need from mining and refining. So, recycle, recycling is extraordinarily enriched mine. So... Less energy intensive, less yeah, like, water. Like a 10 to 100 times less in energy intensive than mining. I mean, when you mine, you have huge chunks of rocks which you have to crush, then they have 100 other things inside them. And chemicals and chemicals, yeah. or other kind of things. But when you refine, when you recycle, you have maybe some small impurity. So the steps and the energy required to get to the same kind of uh, active ingredients are far little. So it's a, and it's kind of an enhanced, enriched mine. I mean, significantly enriched mine than before. And there is so much more legislation happening around recycling. Uh, it's just coming slowly. So, but soon we'll find out where everything is recycled. All lead acid batteries are recycled. Nothing is being thrown away. And all lithium ion batteries would also be recycled. And also they'll be standardized as we go forward. So, I mean, now before we had 10 types of battery phone chargers. Now you, we have one type of phone charger going forward, USB-C. You'll see standardization of cell formats. You'll see standardization on charging formats. So this industry will commoditize in a sense that it makes sense. Economic sense, usage sense, that the whole uh, transition of electrification is not only for the kind of, you know, this advanced users, but for everybody. All grandmas use electrical cars everywhere. So that is, that is where it is heading towards, basically. So basically, you are just killing all the myth about EVs there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there are still some problems, I have to say. I mean, pro problems mean there is some kind of conversion hurdles. Charging is one of them, as you know. Uh, it's a lot of people complain about, hey, how quickly they could charge their 
uh, gasoline car and it takes more time. I think there is going, I mean, as you know very well, there's better and better charging cars coming. But there is, uh, I think there also has to be some shift in the way users are used to do things, right? So you would not have exactly the same usage patterns like before. You may have to think of a brake, to build in a brake where you can charge or top off your battery cells. Um, but I mean, there is also so many benefits. So I mean, a lot of people talk about cold weather as a bad thing, but we don't have cold starts with EV, right? I mean, anybody who had a car in a garage at minus five, it smells so bad. I mean, people forgotten how bad was it, you know, when it was to start. Now the EVs, they, they start easily, they are, have less maintenance. There's a lot of other upsides as well. So I think, and and the gra the basic premise that we need to kind of uh, move from uh, these uh, CO2 emitting vehicles to much more cleaner vehicles, I think that really warrants that we we kind of go and adapt these changes, right? So uh, that is good for us. I think is actually a lot of people would say that is these changes are actually sensible in in itself and uh, if you think about the broader context then i think there are no brainers you have to go for these things yeah um, and uh, you know Raul, you sound like uh, <laughs> you sound like you know a lot about the batteries and cell and and the chemistry behind it uh, uh nowadays uh, we get faster and faster charging cars and i can see in the comments on my on my channel that uh, every time there is a fast charging car they always say ha huh, okay it's charging fast but how fast will it degrade Mm. Uh, how, uh, how yeah. and also can you comment about that plus yeah, you yeah, know sure. the, the new chemistry you guys are making the old yeah <laughs> <laughs> sure sure it's very interesting so this is the application space i think uh, so i i am i mean i have already seen cells and data where people have super charged cars super fast and there is absolutely no degradation after a thousand cycles so and it's not like you supercharge every fifth cycle or tenth cycle. We are talking about every single charge at the highest possible current, but which which a battery can take. Those those chemistries are not in products now. Ah, uh, okay. But I've seen small lab prototypes being built. So I am not afraid that uh, the charging would get significantly faster. I, we 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 will come down to five minute charging station experience that you come in a five minutes and you get a few hundred miles of top of range without any degradation happening to cells. It, it is not going to happen tomorrow because these technologies take time before they are actually made into products which are then validated and then brought into vehicles which are then validated. So it's a longer development cycle. But I can promise you I've seen these things. I've seen small cells, the data which I trust in fully. Uh, it's just a matter of time before they come in. Uh, so that experience is going to get significantly better. Uh, and also, I mean, there is another thing about... Uh, Longevity, you will have battery cells which would basically not degrade. I mean, they will have a million miles, you know, and like there is this talk about it, your seven, eight, 10,000 cycles, your suspension will break, your chassis will break, but your battery is just tip top. It's, it has no problem, actually, absolutely no degradation. Well, in a way, actually, even the 10 year old Tesla batteries, they are still uh, keeping up quite well. Uh, yes. We have seen it now that uh, they, they have maybe 10, 15% degradation. Uh, but uh, usually what kills the batteries uh, is in a leaf or soil or yeah but they they have some bad chemistry maybe or they have bad thermal management so as long as you have thermal management there yeah sure they should last a long time i mean you have to think the model s was developed i think in 2003 so that batteries inside them are from 96 97 they're looking at technologies which are 14 15 years old and I mean, and they're still, as you said, not so bad. I mean, it has moved a lot since then. And the batteries, the cars we'll buy like five, six years from now, I think they would not degrade for like 15, 20 years because they're so much more advanced in the sense of thermal management, like you said, uh, software systems to kind of understand where is it happening? How do you manage it from BMS perspective, from just the basic chemistry, everything has improved. I mean, look at the iPhone. I remember three years back, I went to a ski resort. Hello? It's cold. It's, it doesn't happen anymore. It's minus 25. It doesn't shut down. I mean, this is just, I mean, everybody can kind of associate with that. So battery tech, and here the development cycles are smaller, right? So the, my iPhone is already every two, three years I change. But in a car battery, the development cycles are longer. So the, you don't see the latest technology which people have in their hood. And that would come in the next few years. Hmm. And so 
We are still on this S curve I was talking about yesterday. It's not nowhere near the plateau. So you would see improving ranges, improving charging speed, increasing longevity, uh, decreasing costs, uh, increasing safety. All of these factors where people were concerned about, they would all improve significantly. Hmm. Well, uh, yeah, very, very interesting. Uh, <laughs> I think actually we have to end it now, otherwise it's going to be, we, we have to make a, a longer <laughs> sure, I'll be podcast happy. one day. I yeah. think maybe once uh, we can only talk about in the future about our LNMO batteries. I mean, they have, we have two different variants and I think it'll take a long time for me to explain what, what is the difference between these two variants. Very, we'll be very excited to talk about that hmm. in yeah. the future. Yeah, uh, sorry, because I have to look at the clock and we have to go do the, the factory tour. Factory tour. But uh, anyway, uh, I try to uh, sing out the most important topics at least. And uh, uh, yeah, if you guys have more questions, uh, you can just comment it and you guys read the um, sure, yeah, sure. Yeah, read comments. Uh, we'll see. Maybe we have to make a follow-up video. It's just, I feel like we could have talked for hours really about the battery <laughs> and stuff and the whole, the whole ecosystem around it. Yeah, and you could probably kill lots of myths about the batteries and EVs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. I, I mean, I, I would be happy to do that. I think people need to know the real reality as much as, I mean, even though I'm in the industry, but I think uh, I try to provide a balanced view of how things are. Hmm. But thanks for having me, Bjorn, on this, on this chat with you. Yeah, and thank you so much for uh, having this chat. <laughs> so um, I think that's going to be it for now. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. As always, thank you for watching and talk to you later.